form, one of the most important and central activities to what we do, the creation of form, the creation of spaces, we lack any generalized theory. Uh, being modest as architects, though, it, we assume perhaps sometimes that science must have some such parallel theory. But such is not the case. There is not a general theory of morphogenesis in science. And a few brave souls, including Rupert Sheldrake tonight, are prepared to step forward and advance our ideas towards such a theory. Far from being seen as a pioneer, as a result of this, Rupert Sheldrake is seen as a heretic. He would have been burnt at the stake in previous uh, civilizations. But the AA welcomes heretics. The AA welcomes uh, controversial views. The AA has an open mind, I trust, towards all kinds of, of theories. And I think the way in which uh, Rupert, in the previous visits to the AA, has talked about the generation of form has resonated very strongly with the audience. And they have felt that there was something in which he was saying with which they could associate and understand whether or not they knew or believed this was sound science. I think the next few years are going to be incredibly interesting up to the turn of the century as there is a jostling for positions over the great unification theories and the main, major theories for the dominance of these ideas in science. And uh, it's my hope, and I would like to say to Rupert publicly, that it's our hope that it turns out that, it, that science, in the end, favors his views and finds uh, scientific basis they can understand in them. In the meantime, I know full well from his previous visits that the audience at least will, will resonate and respond uh, to, to his descriptions of form because they resonate with the way in which architects as creative individuals. Uh, Rupert has produced a fantastic number of books which are well known. Um, I can read through The New Science of Life, The Presence of the Path, The Rebirth of Nature, The Seven Experiments That Could Change the World. Uh, but tonight we're welcoming Rupert as a, as a previous lecturer, as a friend, I hope, to the AA, and as a very stimulating and exciting experimental, thought experimentist. Rupert. Well, thank you very much. And that was a very appropriate introduction. And it's perfectly true to say that the central problem of biology, one of the central problems of all the natural sciences, namely the development of form, is something which is simply not understood. Um, it's still the central mystery at the heart of biology. When a plant grows from a seed, and in that seed a little embryo, when um, an animal such as ourselves grows from a fertilized egg, a tremendous amount of structure and form appears which was not there before. This process of the coming into being of form is called morphogenesis. Morphe form, genesis coming into being. And morphogenesis is expressed in all organisms, all biological organisms, as they develop. It's also expressed in a behavioral sense. When a spider builds a web, a bird builds a nest, or a termite colony builds their mound. These are architectural kinds of morphogenesis created through the behavior of the animals. They're examples of what are sometimes called animal architecture. And um, many people, including myself, feel that an understanding of morphogenesis uh, can help us understand behavior, because behavior involves forms in these cases of architecture, it's most obvious, but every kind of behavior by animals involves um, forms of behavior. Instincts are sometimes called forms of behavior, patterns of behavior. So the problem uh, that I'm talking about and the hypothesis I'm putting forward of formative causation applies not only to the development of form, but also behavior and indeed the organization and structure of societies and ecosystems. It also applies to the formative processes in the chemical realm, the way molecules develop, the way proteins fold up to have their characteristic three-dimensional structure, and the, the way that crystals form. These are all processes of morphogenesis in the chemical realm. 
And of course, the formation of an atom uh, um, in, involves a, 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 form a, a morphogenesis in the physical realm. The problem of morphogenesis is that more form comes from less. Most of our causal concepts in science are based on an equivalence. The amount of something before a change equals the amount afterwards. That's why you can write equations. For example, in billiard ball physics, you consider the momentum of a billiard ball as it strikes another one. And owing to the principle of conservation of mass, energy, and momentum, you can work out um, what's involved in the change with an equation. The amount of momentum, matter, and energy before the impact equals the amount afterwards. Um, now, in the case of form, that's not so. The amount of form after the fertilization of a human egg and the development of a person, uh, there's more form uh, than there was in the egg itself. More comes from less. Well, the question of form is not a new one. It's been discussed uh, for at least 2,500 years. And the various theories that the Greeks came up with are still with us today. And because I think it helps to get this uh, clearer if we see it in a historical perspective, I'm just going to say something about this historical approach to the problem of form, what people used to say about it thousands of years ago, because what people say about it today is essentially the same, but it's dressed up in different words. It helps you to see the problem more clearly. The way that the Platonic tradition deals with form, as I'm sure most of you know, is in terms of a doctrine of transcendent archetypes. Beyond time and space, there are the ideal forms of all things. They're like ideas outside time and space, which are reflected in the phenomenal world, the world of experience. So a horse, for example, is a reflection of a transcendent horse idea, and each horse participates in that eternal horse essence, which, beyond, which lives beyond space and time. In Christian Platonism, these Platonic ideas were conceived of as ideas in the mind of God, eternally present in the divine mind. In this case, morphogenesis involves the coming into being in the physical world of a form which reflects this eternal archetype. Now, Platonism has had a huge influence on science. Neoplatonism uh, underwent a great revival in the Renaissance, and this had a great impact on the founding fathers of modern science, Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, Newton, Descartes, and so on. They, took, uh, they were really more Pythagoreans than Platonists, but these two ways of thinking are closely related. And they thought that the uh, eternal reality was mathematical, that these mathematical truths lay, were, existed beyond space and time and were reflected in the phenomenal world. Exactly how these transcendent equations or, or mathematical forms or the Platonic archetypes are reflected in a growing horse embryo was never made clear. But nevertheless, uh, it gave an answer to the question of form in terms of a transcendent non-physical pattern beyond space and time. The cause of the form that appeared uh, in the world of experience, uh, the forms of plants and animals, was a transcendent archetype. Well, that tradition is still with us today in many manifestations. The other great classical tradition is that of Aristotle, who was a student of Plato. And Plato, Aristotle, unlike most philosophers, was actually a biologist and had a, a keen understanding of living processes. As I'm sure most of you know, Aristotle thought that every process of change involved what he called the four causes, four different causes you had to take into account. One was the material cause, that of which something's made. The second was the moving or the efficient cause, um, the energy, the movement that helps it come into being. The third, the formal cause, the form or the idea of a thing. And, the, and the, the fourth of the causes was the final cause, the purpose. His example 
Uh, his chosen examples were usually architectural or sculptural. The sculptor making a sculpture to go in the marketplace. The material causes the block of marble. The efficient or moving cause is the chisel hitting the marble. The forming, formal cause is the idea in his mind of the form he wants the statue to take. It's more like an idea, you see, um, than, than a thing. And the final cause is the reason he's making it. He's had a commission to do it, and he's going to be paid for doing it. Without that, he wouldn't be doing it. So all these four causes together are important in understanding uh, the development of form. In biology, Aristotle thought that the form of each kind of organism, a plant or an animal, was given by its soul, its psyche. Um, every species of plant had its own soul, which gave the form to the plant. And within the psyche was what he called entelechy, the end towards which the development was drawn. The final and the formal causes were usually the same. A developing acorn was attracted towards the mature form of the oak tree by this kind of invisible oak tree plan within its psyche. It wasn't just a plan, it was also a motivation. It was drawn towards that. Souls motivated by attraction. Well, this idea of um, Aristotle had a great influence in Europe in the Middle Ages. It was, became part of scholastic orthodoxy. It was integrated with Christian theology by St. Thomas Aquinas. And the idea that all plants had souls was the standard doctrine throughout medieval Europe. The idea that all animals had souls, uh, in addition to the vegetative soul which gave the form to the body, the animal soul gave animals their instincts. And, of course, the English word animal comes from the Latin word anima, which means soul. The human uh, soul had three aspects. The formal aspect that gave, shaped the body, that the animal aspect that gave human beings their animal instincts and nature, and the conscious or intellectual aspect that was to do with the organization of the rational conscious mind. This rational mind was part of a much larger psychic system uh, that uh, underlay the instincts and also the form of the body. And the vegetative aspect of the human soul uh, not only shaped the body as it grew, but also helped to maintain the form, uh, regenerating after injuries, healing of wounds, and so forth. Well, this was the tradition. This was what was practically universally taken for granted in Europe through the Middle Ages, and it has much in common with beliefs found in the rest of the world. It's an animistic system. It treats nature as alive and recognizes the soul in all living beings. A great break happened in the 17th century with the scientific revolution, the mechanistic revolution, uh, through the vision of René Descartes in 1619, which is the first time he had this vision, uh, that nature was a great machine, the cosmos was a great machine, plants were machines, animals were machines, and the human body was a machine. The soul was abolished in nature. The, there was no longer anything, he said, the, such, no such thing as these invisible Aristotelian souls. They were just a figment of the imagination. They didn't exist. All that existed was matter in motion. And um, the human mind was the only animating, non-physical thing left in the entire material universe. And that interacted with the brain in a tiny region of the brain, the pineal gland. But the rest of the human body and brain was just a machine like everything else. Well, <clears throat> this Cartesian revolution laid the foundations for mechanistic biology and medicine. And these are still the orthodox doctrines today. Science is still founded on the mechanistic theory of nature. Um, the machine theory of the cosmos, the machine theory of the body, the machine theory of life. And how, in a, how then did the mechanists in the 17th century explain form? They hadn't got invisible Aristotelian souls. They hadn't got platonic archetypes. They only had matter. And they only had the matter that was there in the egg at the moment of fertilization. Their first theory was that the form is there in a miniaturized state, so uh, inside every rabbit egg is a miniature rabbit, and the development of the rabbit embryo involves a kind of inflation of this pre-existing miniature rabbit. Then, of course, that would have to have miniature rabbits inside that, because rabbits breed like rabbits, and um, uh, they in turn do so. So you had this theory of nested um, tiny rabbits inside tiny rabbits, 
not a terribly convincing theory, but one which mechanists adopted because it was the only one that fitted their ideology. In the 18th century, through the use of microscopes and the examination of embryos, it became clear that biological development was epigenetic. That is to say, it involved the appearance of new forms which were not there before. It didn't involve an unfolding of a previously existing form. Incidentally, the word for this hypothetical unfolding of a miniaturized organism uh, there to start with was called evolution. Unfolding, that's what evolution literally means. And it was this technical meaning of unfolding that um, uh, dominated biological thinking right through the 19th century. Charles Darwin hardly ever used the word evolution in his theory of evolution. Uh, he used the phrase descent with modification or simply progress. He deliberately avoided the idea of evolution because evolution implied, according to all traditional European thought, the unfolding of a pre-existing miniaturized form. Well, <clears throat> the, uh, throughout the 18th and the 19th centuries, there was a great controversy within biology about the development of form and the nature of organisms. There were two schools of thought. One, the mechanistic school of thought, that said form develops from pre-existing form somehow inside the egg, but we don't know how. The other was called the vitalist school of thought, and the vitalist doctrine uh, was simply that living organisms are alive. The mechanist doctrine was that they're machines, inanimate machines. Vitalism is now treated as the worst of all possible heresies within biology, but it's the one, uh, the theory, mostly in accordance with traditional belief and common sense. And what the vitalists always said was that there's something, some invisible organizing influence. They had many names for it, the vital factor, the nisus formativus, uh, the elan vital, the entelechy following Aristotle. Um, some invisible organizing factor which shapes organisms, gives them their form. And it's this which is the answer to the problem of biological form. The mechanists always denied that this was so. They said that this involved a relapse into primitive, animistic, and superstitious thinking that had no place in hard science, and persisted in believing that everything could be explained by matter inside the egg. Well, with the discovery of the Mendelian genetics, then chromosomes and genes, and more recently DNA, many mechanists thought, well, this is it. We've at last found the material cause of form. And many mechanists to this very day believe that DNA, chromosomes, and what they call the genetic program uh, can explain the appearance of biological form. However, they can only do this by endowing DNA and the genes with most of the properties of the Aristotelian entelechy. The genetic program is actually an entelechy in disguise. It's a purposive organizing principle. A program has an end, in, uh, it has an end to it. It's a finalistic thing. And, um, of course, computer programs, which are the basis of this analogy, are made up by intelligent be beings to organize the activity of the computer. Um, all these aspects of the analogy are brushed aside. But um, my own view of contemporary mechanistic biology is that it's actually a form of crypto-vitalism. And it's the role ascribed to the genetic program is essentially the traditional role ascribed to vital factors, but in a disguised form. However, leaving aside that particular problem, I want to show why this, this approach doesn't really work. If you think about your arms and your legs, um, they have identical DNA. All your cells have the same genes, the same chromosomes. In other words, they have the same program, if we regard the DNA as a program. And your arms and your legs have the same kinds of cells within them, too. The same kinds of muscle cells, nerve cells, bone-making cells, and so forth. Chemically, they're identical. If you grind up an arm and a leg, not of a person, hopefully, but and this happens all the time with cows and so on, um, if you analyze them, they're chemically the same. They, the, the, there's no chemical difference between them. You can't explain the difference in form between the arm and the leg, either in terms of the genes or in terms of the chemicals that make them up. 
You can see the same thing more clearly, perhaps, with the help of an architectural analogy. You can build two buildings of a different form using the same building materials. You could use the same kinds of bricks, cement, um, reinforcing steel, concrete, and so forth. And you could come up with two different buildings. They, they might even cost the same. They might have the same amount of materials and involve the same amount of labor. But what's different is the plan, the architect's plan. The, um, uh, the, the form, what Aristotle would have called the formal cause. <coughs> you see, the problem with mechanistic science, and why, as John remarked right at the beginning, there's a central vacuum when it comes to the problem of form within our current uh, system of science, is that since the 17th century, science has been based on an ideology that attributes causation only to what um, Aristotle would have called the material and the efficient causes, only to the matter and to the moving cause, matter and energy, uh, of which things are uh, made. It ignores formal causes, those patterns or forms, and final causes, goals which attract things, um, in its, as part of its ideology. However, these have all come back again, as I shall show soon, in rather disguised ways. Well, the problem with the mechanistic approach to understand form in terms of genes is that, firstly, that genes aren't programs. What they do is code for a sequence of amino acids in protein molecules. And so genes enable organisms to make particular proteins. But there's a big difference between making a bunch of proteins and having an organism with cells and tissues and so on. It's the difference between a building and a building site on which the building materials are simply dumped. It's assumed that once the right proteins are there, they'll assemble themselves by a process called self-assembly, left unexplained, uh, to generate the entire organism. Well, um, so the entire focus of contemporary research is on the genetic level and the way the genes code for proteins and um, looking at the genetic aspects of development. But since the 1920s, there's been uh, an alternative theory of form, and this is the tradition within which I find myself. In the 1920s, a new concept was introduced into biology, namely the concept of the morphogenetic field the form-shaping field, or formative field. The idea was that an arm was the shape it is because it's shaped by an invisible mold or pattern within and around the developing uh, embryonic limb. Uh, an arm field, the leg is shaped by a leg field. Uh, the whole organism is shaped by a field for that particular kind of organism. The the primary analogy that was used by the people who formulated this idea, Gervich in Russia, Spemann in Germany, uh, and Weiss in Austria, all independently within a year of each other, um, the primary analogy behind this was the magnetic field. Now, it's an interesting thing that when science in the 17th century abolished souls in nature, invisible, organizing principles, it was left with a lot of phenomena that couldn't be explained, namely magnetic phenomena, electrical phenomena, and indeed gravitational phenomena. How on earth could matter attract matter at any other part of the universe, as Newton said, with nothing in between? There was an action at a distance involving some kind of miraculous action of matter on other matter. How could a magnet attract another ma magnet at a distance with nothing in between? Uh, science didn't address this mystery, it simply forgot about it for a century or two. And it wasn't until the work of Michael Faraday here in London in the 1840s that this field concept was introduced into science. And what fields are, are invisible organizing principles within nature that do many of the same things that the old souls did in the pre-mechanistic view of nature. Before the 17th century, the uh, the behavior of magnets in attracting or repelling other magnets was ascribed to the magnetic soul within and around the magnet. The way that magnets pointed to the north magnetic pole of the Earth was ascribed to the magnetic soul of the Earth. The way the planets and stars held together was ascribed to the soul of the universe, the anima mundi. 
Well, um, after the Cartesian revolution, none of these concepts were allowed. But they all began to come back again after Faraday introduced the field concept. Instead of the magnetic soul, we had the magnetic field, an invisible connecting influence with a pattern, a shape. And when people said to Faraday, what is the field? What's it made of? He said, I don't know. He said, it's a pattern in space. You can reveal it by the iron filings around a magnet, the patterns of lines of force around a magnet. Um, but the nature of the field, he said, I don't know. He said, there are two possibilities. One is that it's made of subtle matter, the ether. The other possibility is that the field is a modification of mere space. That was his own phrase. Well, Maxwell, who formalized Faraday's discoveries into his well-known field equations of electromagnetism, and at the same time enabled light to be explained as an electromagnetic radiation, um, and indeed prepared the theoretical background for radio waves and many other forms of electromagnetic radiation. Um, Maxwell preferred the idea of the ether, a subtle matter that was the basis of these fields. But Einstein, in 1905, in his special theory of relativity, got rid of the idea of the ether and just took up Faraday's preferred idea, the idea that fields are modifications of mere space. Fields are not made of matter. Rather, matter is made of fields containing energy. Matter is now seen as energy bound within fields, and it's these fields which, which give shape, form, and structure to the energy. An electron is energy bound in an electron field, vibrations of energy in an electron field. A proton is vibrations of energy in a proton field. An atom is a vibratory structure of activity. And the energy within these fields can be transformed into any other form. Energy can flow from one form to another. It's the specificity of the form, of the organization of things, doesn't depend on the energy. It depends on the fields that organize the energy. The energy gives them their actuality, their activity. But that energy can take any form. Well, this is one of the great insights of 20th century science. And the field uh, idea was then applied to biological form against this background of change in physics. It was the idea there's a new kind of field, morphogenetic fields, that shape living organisms. They, too, are modifications of space that give form, structure, and pattern to things that shape what happens. Um, and then people thought, well, this will not only help to understand form, it would help us to understand the holistic properties of organisms. One of the remarkable things about living organisms is that they can regenerate. If you cut a flatworm into small pieces, each piece can grow into a new flatworm. If you cut a willow tree into small cuttings, each cutting can give rise to a new willow tree. Each part somehow contains the whole or can give rise to a new whole. This is totally different from any machine we know of. If you cut a supercomputer into small pieces, all you get is a broken computer. And the, um, the analogy in the physical realm that corresponds to this biological property is fields. If you cut a magnet into small pieces, each small piece is a complete magnet with a complete magnetic field. So. Um, the field analogy, because fields have this inherently holistic property, you can't have quarter of a field or a slice of a field or a bit of a field. You either have the whole thing or you don't have it. They're holistic in nature. Uh, the idea was that each part of a willow tree, when you cut it up, still has associated with it the morphogenetic field of the whole tree. And this field can act as an organizing blueprint uh, to shape the development of that, the regeneration of that cutting into a new tree. Well, this was one of the attractive features of uh, morphogenetic fields. Another aspect of them was that they were considered to be hierarchically organized in nested hierarchies. <coughs> this 
this, in fact, reflects the holistic pattern of organization we find everywhere in nature. The old mechanistic model was based on trying to explain everything in terms of the smallest bits of matter, the atoms. Well, the bottom dropped out of the atom a long time ago, and then the quest was to explain it in terms of subatomic particles, but then it was found there were lots of those. The only limit to how many we find, there are over 200 known, uh, is not set by nature herself, but rather by the willingness of governments to go on spending billions of dollars on gigantic accelerators, a process that's near its end, apparently. Well, um, the holistic model is that nature is made up of many levels. Atoms, can, you could think of the lowest level there, the little circles here, as um, subatomic, sorry, subatomic particles inside atoms, atoms inside molecules, each level being a kind of whole which contains parts which are themselves holes at a lower level, and then that, the, uh, the molecules inside a crystal. Or you could think of these as organelles inside cells, cells inside tissues, tissues inside organs, organs inside organisms, organisms in societies, societies in ecosystems, ecosystems in, plan in Gaia, Gaia in the solar system, solar system in the galaxy, and so on. Like those addresses that some of us used to write as children, ending up with the universe. Um, well, this... Um, nested hierarchy of organization must be reflected in the organizing fields. And from the beginning, the morphogenetic field concept has been based on the idea there are fields at different levels, cellular fields for each kind of cell, tissue fields for each kind of tissue, organ fields for each kind of organ, um, and fields for the whole organism. Well, all this... Um, this concept of formative fields or morphogenetic fields has had a great influence in biology and is a fairly mainstream concept in modern developmental biology. The differences of opinion arise not so much in relation to the concept of morphogenetic fields but into how they're interpreted. The how are we to explain these fields? If we can explain many biological mysteries in terms of these fields, then how do we explain the fields themselves? Well, this is where uh, opinions differ sharply, even violently. And um, I could say that there are basically three main theories of morphogenetic fields. The first is the Platonic theory, much beloved by mathematicians. Biology uh, again and again, has people coming to it with, from a mathematical background who think, well, the trouble with biology is all these biologists don't know any mathematics. The whole thing's much too qualitative. Uh, we need to get hard mathematical methods in here, and um, we'll sort them out. Well, this has happened for many generations, and they're still trying to do it. And what, uh, what mathematicians do when they come into biology and look at this morphogenetic field concept is say, well, what we need is the equations for the morphogenetic fields, the mathematics for them, because that co would constitute an explanation, just as an equation for the electromagnetic field in physics somehow explains it, although quite why this equation should explain a tangible field that uh, actually does things in front of your very eyes, enables a magnet to pick up iron filings. How the equation beyond space and time is related to that is never explained, hardly even discussed. Um, the same assumption is brought to bear. It's essentially a mathematical problem. What we need is smarter mathematicians, new mathematical methods, perhaps a development of René Tom's differential topology, um, perhaps developments of chaotic dynamics, um, perhaps uh, what many biologists think of as the nature of morphogenetic fields attracting organisms towards endpoints. Perhaps that can be explained in terms of dynamical attractors, because mathematics has reinvented the entelechy uh, and under the name of attractor, and this is now an important part of modern mathematics. Um, perhaps um, computer models are the best way to go, and this is a popular line at present. Um, Anyway, that's one way of thinking about them. 
The trouble with it is that mathematics, precisely because of this platonic nature ascribed to it, uh, doesn't evolve. The morphogenetic field for a dinosaur, according to this point of view, would have existed at the moment of the Big Bang, would still exist today uh, in the sense of a equ dinosaur equation beyond space and time. And it would make no difference to that equation whether the dinosaurs had ever evolved, the fact they've become extinct. All these things would be quite irrelevant because these mathematical uh, truths are supposed to dwell in a realm quite beyond mere historical fact or contingency. Well, that approach appeals to physicists and mathematicians who have always thought in a rather platonic way. It doesn't usually appeal to most biologists. Uh, biologists tend to be more materialistically uh, based. Uh, and so what the conventional view, I would say, in biology is to say, OK, we need this concept of morphogenetic fields to explain morphogenesis. We don't know what they are, but we will know what they are sooner or later. What they'll turn out to be is just a shorthand, a way of thinking about complex physico-chemical interactions not yet fully understood, which doesn't amount to saying very much. Um, it amounts to saying, really, we don't know what they are, but we think we'll be able to explain them in terms of the known fields of physics, electromagnetic, gravitational, and quantum fields, and in terms of known principles of chemistry. We, there's nothing new here. There's no new kind of field. So what started as a departure, a, a brave idea, a new kind of field, a new concept, has collapsed back into uh, a kind of vague sense that, well, there's nothing really new going on, it's just a very complex, give us time, five years, ten years, twenty years, we'll figure it all out in terms of genes and proteins and molecular biology. That, I would say, is the contemporary uh, conventional view. Um, I don't think it will ever work for the reasons I've, sh I've uh, explained. I don't think you can ever explain the development of form from the bottom up, from this reductionistic framework, because it has no formal principle, no but nothing that can give the form. Self-assembly, um, pattern formation through um, interactions of a chemical kind uh, can go so far, but I don't think it can explain biological uh, development. I myself take the view that morphogenetic fields are a new kind of field. They do really exist in the same sense that magnetic and gravitational fields exist. They have the same kind of reality as these other fields. Um, and, um, moreover, I take the view that since they are essentially concerned with evolving forms, every biological form has evolved, every form has a history. Human beings haven't always looked as they look today, nor have birds, nor have mammals, nor have fish, uh, nor have plants. All uh, the fossil records and the whole study of biological evolution shows us that biology has involved a great process of transformation, the appearance of new forms from old ones and the modification of old forms. That, in other words, biological forms have a history, they evolve. And I think that morphogenetic fields must therefore have a history, that they must evolve, that history must be built into them in some sense. And this is the basis of my uh, hypothesis of formative causation uh, through morphic resonance. The medium of formative causation are the morphogenetic fields, or to use a more generic term, morphic field. Um, morphic uh, refers to the Greek word morphe, form, and the reason I use it is because it, it in includes morphogenesis. It also includes the fields that organize behavior, it also includes the fields that organize mental activity and society. It's also easier to say. So many people tell me, oh, I, you know, I've been thinking about your morphogenetic fields or your morphogenic fields or your morphogenic fields, gen uh, generical fields. I, th th somehow, most people can't get the idea of morphogenetic fields. Morphic field is easier. And so that's the term I usually use. Well, I propose that these fields are shaped by the actual forms of past organisms. So the morphic fields of a giraffe depend on the actual form of past giraffes. So there's a kind of memory built into these fields. Because
because all past giraffes differ from each other, when you superimpose them, as it were, their memory, the morphogenetic fields of the giraffe are not sharply defined. Rather, they're probability structures. They're blurred at the edges, if you like. You can get an analogy for this through composite photographs, where you superimpose the photographs of lots of different people's faces. You get a kind of average face. Um, and that's quite a good analogy for morphogenetic fields. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the way that this memory is carried it happens by the process I call morphic resonance, the influence of like upon like through or across space and time. And a, a present-day giraffe will resonate with previous ones, so that, um, that this resonance based on similarity, transferring information through space and time, is the basis of this memory. And it's the basis of the way that each species has a kind of collective memory. Each member of a species draws upon the collective memory of the species and in turn contributes to it. Well, as I say, this idea of morphogenesis, morph uh, formative causation, doesn't just apply to biology. I think it applies to the evolution of chemical forms, of crystals, of social forms, and indeed of cultural forms like languages, um, cultural ideas, what Richard Dawkins calls memes, um, like memory units that propagate through societies. This hypothesis leads to many testable predictions. In the realm of chemistry, for example, if you make a new chemical compound that has never existed before, the very first time you crystallize it, I'm suggesting there won't be a morphic field for those crystals. They will never have existed before. So there won't be a memory of that kind of crystal, because they've never happened. A new field will have to come into being. Then, if you crystallize it a hundred times, a thousand times, a million times, because of the influence of the previous crystals, an influence which will be felt all over the world, irrespective of distance, just on the basis of similarity, um, the morphic field of that crystal will become more strong, the probability of it happening again will be greater, and the crystals should form more easily as time goes on. By contrast, the conventional view is that the form of the crystal is determined by the laws of nature, like the laws of thermodynamics, electromagnetism, quantum mechanics, and so forth. And that these laws determine the form of the crystal the first time it's made, the thousandth time it's made, the millionth time it's made. The laws are always the same. They never change. They don't evolve. It doesn't matter whether the crystal's ever made or not. It doesn't make any difference to these laws, which are quite unchanging and unaffected by anything that actually happens. That's the conventional view. So the conventional view would say the crystal should form the same way the first time or the millionth time, whereas I'm suggesting that they should form more easily the more often they're made. Well, it's in fact well known to chemists that new compounds do form more easily the more often they're made. Things get easier to crystallize all around the world as time goes on. They often take weeks or months to crystallize for the first time. Uh, but then, when lots of people have done it, it just becomes commonplace. And it's not just chemists telling, what, how, telling each other how to do it, because the same thing happens with contaminant crystals that they don't want to form, um, that in, in, uh, interfere with industrial processes and so on. Well, the way that chemists usually explain this is in terms not of a rigorously tested theory, but in terms of anecdotes, which are very much part of the folklore of chemistry. Every science has its folklore, its oral tradition, and chemistry has an unusually rich one. And if you ask chemists about this, they'll tell you that, oh, well, we know why that happens. It's because fragments of previous crystals get carried from lab to lab and infect crystallization processes. And you say, well, how do they get from lab to lab? And the usual story you hear is, on the beards of migrant chemists. Um, if there haven't been any migrant scientists visiting the lab, it's assumed they've traveled as invisible dust particles through the atmosphere. 
what I'm saying is that even if migrant chemists are rigorously excluded and dust particles filtered from the atmosphere, this accelerated crystallization should still happen. Not only that, but the more often you make compounds, as the morphic fields of the crystals get stronger, uh, it should be harder to break those compounds down. In other words, if you're going to break the crystals up, you need a higher temperature to do it. In other words, their melting point should rise. Well, it's an amazing thing, uh, when I started looking at the chemical literature, that uh, newly formed compounds do, indeed, uh, tend to have rising melting points. In the case of some compounds made for the first time this century, the melting points have gone up by 7, 8, 10 degrees centigrade, in some cases 30 or 40 degrees centigrade. Now, this is a fact utterly ignored by chemists, and when you bring it to their attention, they say, oh, well, that's just because um, it must just be because um, purer compounds have higher melting points and people get better at making them purer, and that's why the melting points go up. We say, well, how do you actually know that later ones were purer than the earlier ones? And they say, well, they must have been purer because they had higher melting points. <laughs> well, there may be some truth in what they say, but I, I've, my reading of the evidence is that it can't explain all the facts. And um, this, again, is an area where tests in the realm of a hard science like chemistry could help to shed light on this great mystery of morphogenesis and its historical evolution. In the realm of behavior, morphogenesis uh, leads to many predictions. Um, uh, morphic resonance theory leads to many predictions. If rats learn a new trick in London, rats should learn the same thing quicker everywhere in the world just because they've learned it here if they're kept under similar conditions. And the more that learn it here, the easier it should get everywhere else. Well, there's already evidence from laboratory studies on rats that they do show mysterious increases in learning all around the world. I discuss this in my books on um, the theory of morphic resonance, A New Science of Life, the first one, and then the second book, which is more detailed and fuller, is The Presence of the Past. And uh, if any of you want to read uh, about these ideas in more detail, that's the book to look at, unless you have a scientific background, because A New Science of Life is rather more technical. Um, the hypothesis applies, of course, to biological morphogenesis, and there are many tests that can be done there in the development of fruit flies, the growth of plants, and so on. It applies to people. It should be easier to learn what other people have already learned. And it's, in fact, the idea is a bit similar to Jung's notion of the collective unconscious, which he thought of as a collective memory. It might even help to explain uh, fashion, the way changes in thought or patterns of ideas can spread so quickly. We know, of course, that these depend on newspapers, TV programs, and so on. But many people who've reflected on these things, particularly on parallel discoveries and inventions, think that there's more to it than that. And I think the, the more there might be to it than that is, could be morphic resonance. Well, these are areas where experimental tests are going on. Some of them have yielded very clear evidence in favor of morphic resonance. Some of them have been rather ambiguous, haven't worked so well. And it's still not clear what the consensus will be. It's an area involving active research. And I myself think that the most persuasive evidence comes from biological morphogenesis and from chemistry. What I'm saying in the most general sense is that the so-called laws of nature may be more like habits. You see, we've all been brought up to believe that nature is governed by the laws of nature. And the concept of the laws of nature um, is basically a theological concept formulated in the 17th century. God is the lord of the universe, and just as an emperor makes up the laws that everybody has to follow, so God gives the laws to the universe. And these laws are eternal because they're eternal ideas in the divine mind. And because God is all-powerful, he also acts as the universal law enforcement agency to make sure that everything, except perhaps human beings with free will, obey these laws. Well, that made quite good sense in the context of 17th century mechanistic theology, where God was seen as the machine maker of the mechanical universe. But 
In the context of an evolutionary universe, since the 1960s, the, with the Big Bang Theory, we now have the concept of the whole universe as evolving. What about the idea that the laws of nature might evolve as well? Now, physics and chemistry, and indeed biology, are not used to that idea because most of science has grown up in the context of the idea that the universe is eternal, changeless, governed by immutable laws. If the universe is radically evolutionary, which is the new understanding of nature, then why shouldn't the laws evolve? After all, human laws evolve, and the idea of laws of nature is based on an analogy with human laws. It's a metaphor, like most scientific concepts. Indeed, like all scientific concepts, it's essentially metaphorical. If the um, nature is governed by laws, then this is in fact a very anthropocentric me metaphor. As C.S. Lewis once said, to say that a stone falls to earth because it's obeying a law makes it a man and even a citizen. Um, you see, it's a terribly anthropocentric metaphor. Not even all people have laws. No, traditional societies have customs. Uh, they don't have formulated laws. In fact, it's an extraordinary idea when you think about it. The current orthodoxy is that all the laws of the universe were all there at the moment of the Big Bang, some 15 billion years ago, like a kind of cosmic Napoleonic code, uh, perfectly formulated from the outset, uh, springing from nowhere in a single moment. As my friend Terence McKenna has said, present modern science is based on the principle of give us one free miracle and we'll explain the rest. And the one free miracle is the appearance of the entire universe and all the laws that govern it from nothing in a single instant. Well, as he says, this is a limit case of credulity. If you can believe that, you can believe anything. Um, well, Anyway, that's the conventional view. And of course, there's no evidence that all the laws of nature were there at the time of the Big Bang. It's simply a metaphysical assumption. There's no evidence that they remain the same all the time. Um, the, uh, it's simply an assumption. What I'm suggesting is that the regularities of crystals and atoms and organisms may depend on morphic fields, and these habits may evolve. They, indeed, are subject on this view to natural selection. Only successful habits survive. Many new forms of behavior, many new ideas, many new biological mutant forms appear, but most of them are not viable in the environment they find themselves in. They die out, and because they don't get repeated, they don't build up habits. So this would apply um, an evolutionary principle, including a kind of natural selection of habits to the whole of nature. And instead of making law the central metaphor, we'd make habit the central metaphor. One involves a mysterious memory through morphic resonance traveling through time and space in a way that no one, and certainly not myself, actually understands. It's a postulate, it's mysterious, it's not clear how this can happen. It may involve other dimensions, it may involve what David Bohm, the physicist, called the implicate order. No one really knows at the moment. It's mysterious, and you may think, well, that's a real disadvantage. But I put it to you that the alternative of eternal laws, all perfectly formulated at the moment of the Big Bang, outside time and space, not consisting of matter or energy, yet present everywhere and always, maintained uh, as if by some eternal mind, um, this idea is just as mysterious, if not more so. And moreover, it's one which has not really been rigorously scientifically tested or even thought about. It's simply taken for granted. It's part of the paradigm and assumption. On the view I'm putting forward, evolution involves an interplay between the principles of habit and creativity. Morphic resonance uh, helps to maintain habitual forms of organization and habitual forms of behavior, like instincts. In the animals, uh, instincts are like habits of the species, inherited habits, inherited by morphic resonance. It doesn't have to be coded in the genes on this point of view. Um, so uh, you have habits which stabilize things, but habits can't give rise to um, any creative evolution because they just give repetition. 
there has to be a creative principle as well. And so I think evolution involves an interplay between creativity through which new forms are, uh, arise, usually when old habits are broken for one reason or another, because of environmental causes, because of conflicts, because of mutations which cripple organisms and stop them carrying out the usual habits of activity or development. Um, and that there's this constant interplay between habit and creativity, which we experience in our own lives, both personally and culturally. We're all creatures of habit. All the institutions we belong to and social and cultural groups we belong to are creatures of habit too. Yet, within this background of habit, innovation is possible. But it's subject to something like natural selection. Not every good idea, uh, not, a, not every new idea turns out to be a good idea. If you look at the um, new scientist uh, page on patents, every week you see, see all sorts of amazing inventions and gadgets that have been patented, and most of them you never hear of again. Um, so this, uh, this is, I think, uh, a microcosm of what's going on in the whole universe. There's constant innovation. Only some things survive. Habits uh, are repeated through morphic resonance. I'd like to conclude by saying one or two words about my latest project, namely um, uh, the Seven Experiments project. This is uh, formulated in my book, Seven Experiments That Could Change the World, uh, a book which uh, comes out in paperback this week. Um, and. In that, my previous books, uh, The Presence of the Past, A New Science of Life, The Rebirth of Nature, I've been mainly concerned with the influence of time, the temporal aspect on morph of morphic fields, how morphic resonance shapes them from the past. In this new book, I'm concerned more with the spatial aspect of these fields, how they connect things together in space. Um, and I'm also, um, in this book, putting forward a new way of actually doing science, not just a new content for science, but a new way of doing it. Science is very conservative because both of the habits of paradigms, scientific models of reality or paradigms, are themselves habits of thought, which, like other habits, become increasingly unconscious, hard to change. And also the institutional inertia that goes with any kind of institution. Science is a very conservative system. Um, However, the conservatism of science is really something that's not um, a necessary feature of science per se. It's a feature of institutional science. And science can be done not only within inst existing institutions, but potentially by almost anyone. And if the experiments are cheap enough, almost anyone can do them. Most of these seven experiments cost less than £20 to perform, uh, which is why the subtitle of this book is A Do-It-Yourself Guide to Revolutionary Science. And um, I believe that um, this, uh, we're on the threshold of a period when amateurs and students can play a major part in regenerating science, which I think it greatly needs. And we have to remember, of course, that many of the great scientists in the past were amateurs. Charles Darwin, for example, was an amateur naturalist. He never had an academic position. He never had a government grant. He worked at his home in Kent, did experiments in the garden with his children, um, collected barnacles and snails, kept pigeons, belonged to pigeon fancying uh, clubs in London, and so on. Most of the facts on which he drew came from amateur gardeners, plant breeders, animal breeders, farmers, con colonial administrators, and so forth. Um, so, uh, and if, in fact, Darwin had had to apply for government grants to do what he did, almost certainly they would have been turned down. Darwin's theory of evolution would never have passed peer-reviewed committees um, in the 1850s and 60s. Well, that freedom that amateurs have, it could be ours again today. And I'm going to end with just a single example, which concerns the behavior of pet animals. Dogs and cats, domestic animals, are the animals we know best. People observe their pets day in, day out, week in, week out, year in, and year out. They know them often in enormous intimate detail. Compared with that, the scientific understanding of animal behavior is based on laboratory animals kept in cages and given numbers, or else on field ex expeditions by uh, field ethologists, animal behaviorists. 
Well, all this is very important. I'm not saying there's uh, no use to it. But the animals we know most about and know best, this incredible body of experience, 60% of households in Britain and Western Europe have pets in them, has been completely disregarded by science. Not one bit of this information has been used for our scientific understanding of animals. So here's a vast resource of information available to us, potentially, in this new, broader kind of science. As soon as you start talking to pet owners, uh, you discover that their animals are often doing things they ought not to be able to do according to conventional science. For example, many owners of dogs and cats uh, say that their dogs and cats uh, will go to the door and wait for an absent member of the family before he or she comes home, um, and will sometimes wait there for half an hour or more before they return. In many households, I've been told, uh, the people at home use this as a way of knowing when someone's coming home. Many women have written to me, for example, and have told me that um, their husband works irregular hours, might be a plumber, a fitter, a builder, or something, or a lawyer, or a newspaper editor, um, doesn't come home at a routine time, uh, and yet they always know when he's on the way, because the dog will go to the door, or the cat will go to the door and get excited, and so they know he'll be home in 20 minutes or half an hour, so they start cooking his dinner so it's hot on the table when he arrives home. <laughs> a lucky man. Um, uh, the, in households where this happens, people simply take it for granted. They say it's funny, isn't it? You know, how, how do they do it? But they don't really think it through. Now, the conventional scientific explanation such as, well, there isn't one, no one's investigated, but if you bring this up and talk to someone of a fairly conventional scientific kind, they'll bring up the objections that indeed you can think up yourself easily enough. Firstly, is it due to routine? In some cases maybe, but in many cases we already know it's not. Secondly, is it the pet responding to the anticipation of the person at home, who may be guessing when the person's coming, and, and who then may uh, undergo subtle emotional changes as they get excited at the thought of the return of the loved one, or possibly depressed, and <laughs> um, the pet then responds to these subtle emotional cues. Well, that can be eliminated by people coming home at unexpected times, truly random times, picked by flipping coins or other randomizing methods. And then thirdly, there's the idea where maybe they hear the sound of a familiar car engine from 20 or 30 miles away across a major city. And when I discuss this with an animal behavior um, colleague, uh, a friend of mine who works in animal behavior, I said to him, well, surely in these cases where they're coming, they're hearing it half an hour in advance when someone's 20 or 30 miles away, it's inconceivable the pet could be hearing the car engine or smelling it from so far away, irrespective of the direction the wind's blowing in. And he said, on the contrary, it just shows what sharp hearing they've got. <laughs> um, well, that conversation actually led to the idea for this experiment. Well, then come home in another car. Now get a friend to drive you in a car that dog's never heard before, come in a taxi, borrow a bicycle, uh, do something you've never done before. Um, come home, can the pet still tell them you're coming? Well, now, I've been writing about this in my book and asked people to write in, and this has been featured in various newspapers, ranging from the Sunday Telegraph to the Daily Mirror, and um, uh, also on BBC World Service radio. And I've had now had over a thousand letters from people in the last six months uh, about this phenomenon. Many people are now doing these experiments, um, and the results so far are absolutely astonishing. I mean, even I, who thought there must be a real phenomenon here, have been amazed by how well these experiments have worked. Um, when people have come at random times in totally unusual ways, the dogs have still been responding, mainly dogs so far. Um, and just a, a couple of months ago, an experiment was done uh, with two video cameras. This was done by a science unit from Austria working for Austrian television. They asked me if I could find an animal in Britain uh, that could do this, could film for their program. And I said I could, but if they were going to do it and if I was going to persuade the people involved to take part in this, uh, then would they do a proper experiment, have two cameras, come home at a random time, and use a taxi or other unfamiliar vehicle? And they agreed to all this, to do it as a proper experiment. Well, this experiment was done um, 
um, was a, a young woman called Pam Smart who lives near Manchester. And she has a dog, uh, a terrier, that knows when she's coming home. It's been doing this for several years now. What happened was they left the dog at home with her parents, where it normally stays. A cameraman was there with a camera. Unfortunately, the dog, I, I didn't think it would work, because I thought the dog would be put off by all these foreigners and lights and cameras and so on, but it wasn't. And um, that they, they filmed the dog continuously for nearly five hours. They were told to just go on filming it all the time. Meanwhile, they went out, the other people went out with Miss Smart, and they um, picked a time. It was after about three or four, about four hours later, they picked a time at random. And they didn't tell her in advance, and they said, OK, Pam, we're going home now. And there's a camera filming her, there's a camera filming the dog. The cameras have time codes, you know video cameras have time codes. And the playback, they synchronise the cameras and they share it with a split screen. And on one side of the screen you see Pam saying, OK, well, we're going now. And she gets up and she's walking across some grass um, towards the home. And within five seconds you see the dog get up, walk to the window with its tail wagging slightly and look expectantly out. And then it stays there all the time until she comes home. And it hadn't done that in the whole period before uh, she came home. It was with five seconds after she set out for home, before she'd even got into the taxi. Well, we already knew from previous observations with this and other dogs that the dogs, in many cases, were responding to people's intention to come home. Their mere intention to come home before they'd actually done it was enough to trigger off this response. So I think what's happening here is that there's a field linking the dog and the person. It's a social field. It's an example of a morphic field. Dogs adopt us as honorary dogs. And as part of their social group, their social animals. Um, and this field uh, connects the dog and the owner together. And it enables the dog to sense changes in the owner's intentions. And um, the effects, I mean, you could say this is just psychic, it's a psychic dog, a psychic pet, or it's a telepathic terrier, or whatever. Um, the newspapers have used all these phrases. Um, but since we don't understand telepathy or psychic effects, um, you know, these are just different words. Um, well, you could say morphic fields are just different words, too. But uh, they have the advantage of enabling a large number of phenomena to be tied together in a coherent uh, mode of understanding. And there is no coherent way of understanding these kinds of responses of pets, which are extraordinarily common. Uh, not all dogs do it, maybe only about one in four. But still, there are millions of dogs in Britain doing this kind of thing, probably at this very minute. There are tens of thousands of them doing it. Um, this, from the point of view of science, is a paranormal phenomenon. From the point of view of pet owners, it's perfectly normal. It happens all the time. Um, anyway, um, there are seven or six other experiments in this book, equally cheap. This one, incidentally, the total global budget for the last six months of research on the pets that know when their owners are coming home has been less than £100, and that's all been in taxi fares. Um, <laughs> If, if any of you have dogs or cats that do this, you can take part in this research starting straight away. There are other experiments I put forward which would all relate to the extended effect of these extended fields and the way they connect things together. Um, I haven't time to go into the other six, but if you look at the book, you'll see that some of them uh, are things that anyone in this room could do if they wanted to. Uh, and some of them can be done for actually nothing at all. <coughs> uh, some of them you need to toss a coin to randomize things, but the coin can be recycled indefinitely. So there's a minimum investment of one penny um, for some of the most radical of these experiments. I myself believe that we're on the threshold of a scientific revolution in which we have come to see things in a much more interconnected and holistic way. And at the center of the new science will be um, something which will fill the vacuum uh, that we've had until now about form, morphogenesis, and generative processes. And I believe that change in science is coming about both through internal processes in science, mainly in physics, which has long since transcended the old mechanistic view of the world. But also, uh, these processes, I think, can be accelerated by anyone who feels sufficiently motivated to take part in this new process of opening up science. Thank you.
same to see as on the mics. If we have some general questions um, first, if we could take those, and otherwise you can go and lobby Richard later with your individual tales of Rupert Jack, with your individual tales of, of cats and dogs and, and the rest. Are there any general questions I can take, Rupert? Do, do you think if, if, if uh, uh, su super strength and space time can equate to a ho 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 holomorphic curve in twister space, that, uh, then that, that uh, cosmic strength that, that would have existed uh, just at the early stages of the Big, big Bang can equate to a, a curved crystal defect? Well, um, the answer is I'm not sure. I, the, let me put it in a more general context, your question. I mean, not everyone here probably knows about superstring theory. Superstring theory is a theory of the origin of the universe um, in which there was one unified field before the existing the, the gravitational and the electromagnetic fields and so on appeared. Everything was organized by... A, a universal, unified field um, which existed in ten dimensions, nine of space and one of time. Well, a lot of people think proposing extra dimensions is kind of weird, freaky, fringe stuff. Well, nowadays it's mainstream in physics. And superstring theory with ten dimensions, I mean, the only discussion among superstring theories is whether there are ten or thirty-four. Or, and dimensions come cheap in modern physics. Um, well, um, certainly perturbations and uh, so on in, in, in this state could affect what happens later. But one thing that struck me about superstring theory is that this theory, um, impressive though it is, and influential though it is, only operates at scales of up to 10 to the minus 30th of a centimeter, which is in infinitesimally small. And I spoke to its originator at a seminar when I, I suddenly realized that he was talking about things below 10 to the minus 30th of a, as, as a, a centimeter. I mean, I, I was talking about the universe when it was that small. That's what the theory is about. And I said, well, don't you think this is a bit of a limitation? I mean, no, we're, things are a bit bigger than that now. And he said, oh, yes, there is a problem here in mass. who are working on it. But um, essentially, superstring theory is highly speculative, and it's confined to a very, very early stage of the universe in its present form. There are other things called cosmic strings, which are not part of the superstrings. It's some other kind of defect, which were proposed to account for the formation of galaxies. And no one knows where, if you start with a uniform universe, you should get galaxies arranged in clusters. It's basically the problem of morphogenesis on a cosmic scale, and it's no more solved in the question of the whole universe than it is in the question of the development of a tadpole from frog spawn. George Mallon? I wonder if you could speculate a little bit on the relationship of language this rather late development in our, in our culture uh, to all the rest of Well, there are many people like Noam Chomsky who believe that you can't understand language without understanding that a lot of it is innate in some sense. And the reason he thinks this is because young children can learn language so quickly and so creatively in a way that old style stimulus response type psychology couldn't account for. Because of this, many people agree with Chomsky that um, language, there's some inherited ability to learn language that facilitates our learning of it. But since Chomsky um, has, he then turns to his colleagues at MIT or wherever he works and asks the biologists, how does inheritance work? And they say, oh, it's all genes, it's programmed in the genes. So he says, well, therefore, to account for the fact that young Chinese children, if put down in England, can learn English, English children can learn Chinese, it can't be something that's racially specific. Therefore, there must be genetic programming for all languages equally, a universal grammar built into the genes um, that somehow enables children to learn any language in this way. Now, that bit has no direct evidence for it. In my opinion, it's highly implausible. And it would then, being neo-Darwinian, suggest that all this language learning ability evolved by random mutation in the first place. None of this seems to me very plausible. It's not an essential part of Chomsky's observations on language acquisition. It's where he borrows an off-the-shelf uh, conventional theory from biology and takes for granted the conventional wisdom. 
Now, since I don't think that conventional wisdom can even explain the development of the simplest plants, um, my own view is that language acquisition is facilitated by morphic resonance. If you start listening to and hearing German or Dutch or, or Swahili or whatever, or Telugu, um, you, as it were, through hearing it and the young child learning it, you, as it were, resonate with those who've learned it before. And through morphic resonance, you tune in to past speakers of the language, which would greatly facilitate the acquisition of it. So you can explain the facts without requiring either a universal grammar or this genetic programming of the universal grammar, which are two of the most controversial features of Chomsky's theory. Um, morphic resonance uh, can enable these things to be understood much more clearly and directly, I believe. Um, it may also apply to the understanding of written language, which is, of course, a much later development. The writing of language you know, is only a few thousand years old compared with spoken language. And who knows? We don't even have a clue how some people say 50,000 years, others say 100,000 years, others say a million. We don't know how long language has been around. Um, it's amazing how little we know about our own origins. Um, but anyway, I would think of language as having um, being organized by morphic fields. It has a nested hierarchical structure, of course, like everything else. I mean, that in those, those diagrams I showed, you could have phonemes inside syllables, inside words, inside phrases, and so on. So we've got this kind of nesting of structure in language, which fits with this general pattern of things. And I think it would be relatively easy to apply morphic resonance theory in detail to language. No one has yet done that, because the theory itself is too controversial. Um, following on from that, have you not uh, unclosed or actually done some experiments? Oh, I've done some experiments with written languages. And um, the, the written language experiments, um, one of which is described in my book, The Presence of the Past. This was done at Yale University with Hebrew words written in Hebrew. Um, another one has been done with Persian words written in Persian. And this experiment was done in Australia recently. The, I'll describe the Persian word experiment. Uh, this was done in, at, in Tasmania. And um, it involved people who didn't know Persian um, and who didn't know how to read and write Persian, which, as you know, is written in a left-to-right squiggly writing, a bit like Arabic or Urdu. Um, they're not difficult in Tasmania to find suitable candidates for this experiment. Um, they were shown words written in Persian, and they had 10 seconds to look at this word, and then it was taken away. They were then asked to write it down in Persian in Persian writing. So basically we're talking here about a pattern recognition, a visual pattern recognition uh, test. It had already been found in previous experiments that if people were given bogus words, you know, they were real Persian letters, but they were joined up to form non-words. Like in English, cat is, means cat, but A-T-C doesn't mean anything. Um, it's the same letters, but organized in a different way. Um, it had already been found that people couldn't remember as well uh, words that were false words compared with real words. The re latest experiment on this in Australia involved all real words. But while people were looking at the real words, they, were here, they had a tape recording. And on the tape recording, they had, first of all, a Persian person saying the word in Persian. So they got the Persian sound of the word, and then giving the meaning of the word in English. So they got the sound and the meaning while they were looking at it. And then they wrote the words down in Persian. Well, unknown to them, some of the words they were looking at, and the, 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 they were given the wrong sound and meaning. They were given the sound and meaning of a different word, not the one they were actually looking at. And it turned out they were better at remembering and writing down the words when they had the right sound and meaning than when they had the wrong sound and meaning. And the morphic resonance explanation for this would be that millions of Persians over the centuries have associated that sound and meaning with that particular pattern of writing, and that this resonant background somehow facilitated the remembering and reproduction of that word. 
Well, as you can see, this kind of experiment uh, is quite simple to do. Uh, it doesn't cost very much. It's very fascinating. Um, of course, it, as soon as you start in this kind of thing, the experts will start bringing all sorts of technical questions up about it. Well, why didn't you do it with just different sounds, just different sounds, just different... Well, in fact, he has done that. Difference, uh, the right meaning, the wrong sound, uh, the wrong sound, the right meaning. That used to use, it's still easier than if you have uh, the wrong sound and the wrong meaning, but not as easy if you have the right sound and the right meaning. But you can get into all the kinds of details that people like doing for PhD projects. So this is um, a potentially very fruitful line of research involving written language. Well, information, in its literal sense of information, information is something that informs or gives form to or puts form into. In that sense, what morphic resonance involves is a transfer of information rather than energy. It's an informative process rather than an energetic process. I don't usually use the word information because it's been so contaminated by information theory. Information theory is a very limited theory dealing with starting off with the transmission of messages down telephone wires. And it's defined in a quite rigorous mathematical way, but not one that is very relevant in biology. Um, it's to do with the transmission of so many bits from one place to another. Well, when you're dealing with it, it's, all, it's to do mainly with the degeneration of messages, how many messages you can send through a phone line, how much noise will interfere with them. When you're dealing with the development of a an oak tree from an embryo in a seed, you haven't got this equivalence of informational bits at the beginning and the end. And the theory breaks down in biology. It's not very relevant. Um, and there's a lot of confusion because people often use information and in biological information or positional information in a very loose and general sense, which somehow has an aura of scientific respectability because of information theory, but which in fact doesn't involve that theory at all and won't stand up to a rigorous application of it. So I certainly think that what I'm talking about is information in the sense of putting form into things. Uh, it's the form bit in information which is important, I think. Um, but uh, I'm not talking about information theory in its strict and rather limited sense. Yes. And the measures of organization of the possible which came out of uh, information theory, which I would have thought were really rather valuable. Well, it is valuable in a sense, but it's, people did, got very excited about it in, say, the 50s and 60s. And there was a lot of attempts to say, well, how much information, how many bits of information would you need in the genome to specify an organism? But, you know, how much information do you need to specify a giraffe? Information theory is always defined in terms of what could have happened instead of something else. And what could have happened instead of a giraffe? I mean, how can you limit this, you know, a camel or an ant, an earthworm? Um, you know, it's, it's awfully arbitrary what you, how you define the bits. And then people came to do all sorts of calculations, and many physicists did sums and said, well, even if you have all these genes and binary information in the genome, it couldn't possibly code for the amount of information in a complete organism, and this can't possibly explain it. Then other people would say, oh no, on the contrary, our calculations show that it could. And, and it petered out into a very scholastic debate about whether you could explain organisms in terms... And it didn't, in fact, lead to anything very fruitful. And nowadays, it's very rarely discussed in the biological literature or in discussions of biological form. So maybe it could play a part, but it hasn't been very fruitful so far. Maybe we should take one more question before the bar something, let's say. <laughs> complexity theory and the relation of morphic resonance to it. Well, the first problem is what is complexity theory? Um, complexity theory isn't exactly a theory. It's more like a slogan. And um, the, one of the ingredients in it is chaos theory. Um, chaos theory is quite important for what I'm saying because morphic fields work by giving shape to otherwise indeterminate processes. And they also do, they work through attractors 
Now, chaos theory is based entirely on this idea of attractors, dynamic, strange attractors, um, and, uh, or chaotic attractors. So there's quite a lot in common uh, between these two approaches, except that morphic fields go beyond chaos theory, in that although chaos theory has attractors which give a kind of underlying order to what appears to be chaotic, the, um, a, a living organism doesn't even appear to be chaotic, it appears to be ordered. And yet, within that order, there's tremendous probabilism and in determinism. If you look at an oak tree, every leaf on it is recognizably an oak leaf. But if you look at each leaf in detail, it's different from every other. If you look at the pattern of the veins in the leaf, they're all different. Um, so there's a, a kind of freedom and indeterminism in all biological systems within this overall order. And there's an interplay between indeterminism and order. And um, so it's not as chaotic as chaotic systems, but some of the similar principles apply. Now, complexity theory isn't... A, I have a great friend in chaos theory, Ralph Abraham, who's a, one of the Santa Cruz chaos people. Um, and he and I have done a book together on this with Terence McKenna, the um, psychedelic shamanism chap. Um, it's called Trialogues at the Edge of the West. Um, and um, the, the, we, we discuss the, how these things might interrelate. So if you're interested, you could look at that book published by Bear and Co. Um, the, the other ingredients in complexity theory are things to do with economic form and order, the development of pattern of cities. And actually what it is is a slogan invented by people at the Santa Fe Institute to try and get funds. Because um, there are all these retired bomb makers from Los Alamos who want to stay on in the area and do something more respectable. And, and there, there are these economists and so on. And I've been there and you know, visited this thing and there isn't anything very much in common. The problem they had, in fact there's a book on it, Waldrop's book on complexity theory, it tells the story of the Santa Fe Institute and it makes it very clear. All these guys got together, they wanted to find something they had in common, set up an institute so they could all work in Santa Fe, which they liked being in. And um, so they thought up a word, complexity theory, um, which sounded as if it was dealing with all the big problems of the modern world, um, so they could have grant applications. But um, I haven't yet found out there isn't exactly a complexity theory. There are a lot of different people working on the problem of form, generation of patterns. Stuart Kaufman is another one who does a lot of computer modeling to try and see how you can get form emerging from randomized units and so on. Um, and it does fit in with the so-called artificial life theory, which again is another form of computer modeling. Um, all this range of things, mainly based on computer simulation, to do with trying to understand the appearance of form, the generative process, but without, usually, without morphogenetic fields and without morphic resonance, but nevertheless addressing some of these questions, those come under this very loose umbrella term of complexity theory. And some of these people I'm on very friendly terms with. I mean, we're all working in the same direction of trying to understand form, but most of them wouldn't, they'd want to do it without morphic resonance. They prefer to stay within the more conventional frameworks of scientific thinking. I think we should suggest to you the Architecture Association itself as a, as a, as a sort of test bed for your experiment. The Architecture Association, 150 years, has a remarkable continuity despite extraordinary changes of staff and students throughout. Nevertheless, there is this continuity that makes the arm of the, arm of the leg, and the AA definitely mm. has not, not a rabbit habit, well, it has that too, but <laughs> has, a, has a sort of AA habit, which this extraordinary kind of embedded uh, continuity, which is um, very strong and a very strong sense in this room. Anyway, I'd like to thank you enormously. In, in fact, far from commiserating you on about to being burnt at the stake, maybe I think we should um, advance congratulations and, 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 and wishes for possible future bid for a Nobel Prize on the basis of yeah, well. this experimental <laughs> 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 <laughs>